Grace to you and peace from God, our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Uh, we're finally into the catechism itself. Uh, we're going to go through the six chief parts, one at a time, and with their accompanying doctrines. Uh, you know, I introduced a couple weeks ago, and then last week, that really the whole catechism is about you growing in and experiencing faith in Jesus Christ, and then knowing God. Okay, that's what this is all about. Uh, the Ten Commandments reveals our need for faith. The Creed then gives us the faith we need by telling us who God is and what God has done for us. The Lord's Prayer then is the cry of faith, where we cry to God uh, for his good gifts. And then the life of faith, uh, our identity uh, as children of God in baptism, uh, the honesty of faith in confession and absolution, and then the community meal, the family meal in the Lord's Supper. Uh, those are those means of grace are how we stay in the faith. So the Ten Commandments, uh, these are found in two places in the Bible, Exodus chapter 20 and Deuteronomy chapter 5, with you know slightly different wording, I think, in each case. Uh, do note uh, the context, first of all, is God's deliverance of his people out of slavery. Uh, Exodus 20, verse 2. Uh, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. Uh, that's the important context. God does not give his commandments to a people that he has not already saved, that he has already rescued, that he's already redeemed. And as one uh, one. Uh, one of my teachers taught me, uh, remember that Exodus 19 comes before Exodus 20. Uh, God bore, bore the Israelites on eagles' wings and brought them to himself. He says, you shall be my treasured possession among all people. You shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nations. So the Ten Commandments really is a response to what God has done for us in the beginning. Okay, the other thing has to do with the numbering of the commandments, and there's two or three different numberings. Uh, you know, the, the Orthodox and the Catholics, and I think the Episcopalians and Lutherans all normal, number them the quote-unquote right way, because that's what I'm familiar with. And then, uh, if I can call them the Protestants, uh, either the Lutherans are the only Protestants, or we're not Protestants. So when I refer to the Protestants, uh, all the other American Christian churches that aren't Catholic, kind of. Okay, uh, so the numbering is a little bit different, and I think it's really just kind of funny, because we're only told that there's 10, not in Exodus 20, not in Deuteronomy 5. We're told not even that there are 10 commandments, we're told there are 10 words, or that word can be translated thing or matter. So there are 10 words or 10 things or 10 matters. And we go back to Exodus 20 and go, um, it looks like there's 13 or 14 or 15 different words or matters or things. So however you want to number them, uh, I'm going to be using the Lutheran numbering just because it's so ingrained in my head. So for the one person I know who actually knows the the Protestant numbering of the commandments, uh, you have my apologies, uh, but it would be good if, you know, you're a Lutheran, uh, do, do number them our way, but be aware if you're talking to a Protestant, uh, they're going to be numbering, they're going to be one off, you know, they're going to have one higher than, than yours, uh, but, but it's also good to actually memorize the commandments, and I'm kind of thinking, you know, it'd be good to actually memorize Exodus 20, rather than memorize the Ten Commandments, memorize the whole, well, from 20 verse 2 through, what is it, uh, 17? Yeah, you should do that. Yeah, of course, I really should. Got it close, you know, I think. All right, so I'm going to break this up into four parts, uh, four doctrines, four teachings. Uh, and I'm going to do an extended version from what I'm doing on Sunday. So I'm going to start now in this one with the gifts of the commandments. And then we're going to talk about the three uses of the law. And then we're going to talk about the proper distinction between law and gospel. And then we're going to talk about the 
most excellent doctrine of vocation or ministry. All right. So uh, the Ten Commandments, the first chief part, and the primary role that the, the Ten Commandments serve is to point us to our need for Jesus, to point us to our need for God. So let's, uh, let's start. Oops. All right. Uh, so I'm going to quickly go over the gifts that God gives, uh, and, and, but then I'm going to kind of extend to what the anti-catechism, the world's catechism, the devil's catechism, uh, where they seek these gifts in something other than God. And the reason I want to do this is because, number one, God doesn't just give commands that are just arbitrary. Uh, he gives them to protect precious gifts that he gives that he wants us to fully enjoy and have life. Uh, this is what he gave to the Israelites because he said, you know, if you want the gift of life, don't murder, right? So I've given you the gift of life, so don't take life. Because that wouldn't be very enjoyable for the person whose life you take. So uh, hopefully we, we have a greater appreciation of God's gifts. And then when we start talking about the, uh, the world's catechism, they're seeking God's gifts in places where God has prom not promised to give them. Okay, And so hopefully this will inspire conversation with people who are not yet Christians. It'll inspire con conversation where instead of looking down on them, instead of judging them, instead of condemning them, uh, instead of getting mad at them, we go, oh, whoa, you're looking for God's gifts, but you're looking for it the wrong way. You know, so it'll give us compassion, sympathy, empathy for them, and hopefully will help us be able to proclaim the gospel to them uh, when we understand what it is that they're actually seeking. So the first and most important gift God gives us is himself. He says, don't have any other gods because there is no other God who is the source of every good and perfect gift. Every good and perfect gift comes from God our Father and no other God. No other God gives the good gifts that God gives. Now, in the world's catechism, you know, and I left these blank on the screen, but uh, this is the opinion of Steve. This is not thus saith the Lord. When I'm talking about the world's catechism, this is me opining. I hope it's biblically based. I hope it's theologically accurate, but we are in need of much conversation and correction and addition. So these are kind of my thoughts. And again, let's have compassion on people. People are seeking for God. You know, you've heard about the God-shaped hole that people have. Where are people looking for blessing? Where are people looking for good things? Where is their kind of ultimate thing that they're living their life for? You've got people looking for good things from their career from their family, from government, from money and prosperity, from fame, uh, the past, uh, you know, a nostalgic view of the past as if the past holds some kind of good treasure. And if we could just return to the past, uh, some people do that with the future. And uh, we do this with medicine. Now, did I mention anything that's bad? No. The question is, are you looking to God for the source of blessing or are you going, Oh, God's not giving me what I want or God has given me something I don't want. Therefore I'm going to go to something that will give me what I want. I'm going to go to something that will, will take away what I don't want. Okay. That's the point where it becomes a false God, two thumbs down. Okay. You with me? I hope that makes sense because this is so crucial. People don't go looking for good things in bad things. They're going to look for good things where God has promised not to give them. Okay. But they're looking for good things. All right. Number two, the name of God. Uh, here we've got a bit of a translation problem. I'm assuming that most of you listening to me, you memorize the second commandment as you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. 
And then it kind of transmogrified from there to you will not misuse the name of the Lord your God. And, and th that's certainly the way Luther took it, you know, when he says, uh, we shall not curse, swear, lie, use satanic arts, or deceive by God's name, but hold it sacred, God's name sacred, and gladly, oh, and call upon in every trouble, pray, call upon God's name in every trouble, pray, praise, and give thanks. I think I went to the third commandment there. Uh, that is, it's it's primarily about speaking. That is, it's the gift of prayer. And I'd like to expand on that. And if we think of t taking the name of God, or uh, I'm, I'm working on translating it, bear the name. I'm not sure which one works better. It's just, I think when we think take the name, we go mouth uh, rather than bearing the name. Uh, so take the name works. You know, when... When I was born, I took the name of my parents, and I took the name of American. Uh, when my wife married me, she took my name. When my son was born, he took my name. Uh, when when I became uh, the pastor of King of Glory, you know, I, I took the name of member of the King of Glory family. You know, that idea of taking the name, that we're bearing the name, it's not just what we say, it's who we are. And what I especially love about this, it's a couple of things about this uh, particular interpretation, which I'm pretty sure is right. So hopefully you look at this and go, yeah, that's what we already believe. Now we've got just more ammunition. So God says, you shall have no other gods before me. Positively, God is saying, I am Yahweh, your God, which is 20 verse 2, Exodus. Uh, commandment 2a, you shall not make for yourself a carved image. Commandment 2b, you shall not bow down to them or serve them. Commandment 2c, you shall not take the name of Yahweh your God in vain. Notice how those three go together. We are not to make any images of God because we are the image of God. We are not to take the name of Yahweh our God in vain because we bear the name of Yahweh our God, right? That is so cool. We're the image of God and we bear the name of God. We are God's people. So the commandments go like this. Commandment one, I am your God. Commandment two, you are my people. You know, you're my image, you're my people, you're my co-regents with me. Or we, and we say back to God, you are our God and we are your people. Uh, that's a continued refrain throughout the Bible. Every time I read through the, the Bible, it has, it'll have that a few times where God says, I am your God and you are, you are my people. And we cry back to God, you are our God and we are your people. And that's what the first two commandments are. So cool. So very cool. Where do people find their name? Where do people find their identity? You know, hitting close to home, we're Lutheran. You know, rah, rah, Lutheran. Yay, Lutheran. Uh, you know, we're Lutheran. We have the pure doctrine. We have the law and the gospel. We have the word and the sacraments because we're Lutheran. Uh, or whatever it is, you know, whatever your denomination or your church, you find your identity not in Christ Jesus, but in fact, uh, a denominational label. Now, as you know, I'm a pretty big Lutheran hound. You know, I value our Lutheran theology, but Lutheran is not my identity. Uh, same thing with Christian, where we, we take the name of Christian and we forget about Jesus. It can happen. Uh, we can do the same thing with uh, the title of American, you know, whatever American means, and people have different ideas of what it means to be an American, uh, but it becomes part and parcel of our identity. And what happens if that is taken away from us? What happens if that identity, that label is taken away? What happens if that name is taken away from us? What, what do we do? You know, do we, do we lose our identity when we lose the name of Christian or American? And I hope you go, no, I'm, I'm a child of God. God's name is upon me. My identity is found in Christ. Uh, I've noticed people do this with the titles of Democrat and Republican. 
where where they're so caught up in who they are as their identity with Democrat and Republican, you know, if you've got that label, I vote for you. And it doesn't matter what kind of scum you are. If you got the title Democrat or you got the title Republican, you got my vote. Um, does it matter what kind of scum they are? Does it matter if they're not good people? I, I, I you know, the other side is evil and we're good. Whoa, uh, as an outsider, someone who's not a Democrat or a Republican, I look at both sides and just go, whoa, you know, how you talk about each other and then how you talk about yourselves, it's really disturbing, really disturbing. Some people get their identity from their job, from their work. Uh, someone brought up in Bible study that, you know, men, men will retire and then die because their whole identity was caught up in their work. Of course, that might be just because they finally rested and their body went, okay, that was a hard life. I'm done. And then they just die. But I, I think a lot of it is they just, they've lost their identity and then they lose their lives. Uh, you'll see this with the, you know, race, class, gender, color, class, gender, uh, the identity politics of today. Uh, and, and be very careful not to overreact to this. Uh, but, but you think about it, uh, race and color, where you're identifying people by the color of their skin or by their gender or by their class, and they're labeled that way. And when you label people, you negate their personhood. And especially... You know, I, I love the variety that we have in this world, you know, the variety of skin color, the variety of cultures. I very much appreciate that we have two sexes and not one. Uh, I love that kind of variety that God gives to us. And uh, I, I even like that we have different classes of people, you know, upper class, lower class, whatever. Uh, I love the variety. But is that where you get your identity? I, I know, I know a lot of white people, we bristle when we're labeled as white people, uh, <laughs> as if that's our identity. Uh, and I want to say back, no, no, that's, that's not who we are. Uh, but along, along these lines, uh, I probably should address systemic racism. And I've noticed, I've noticed uh, people I hang out with, we bristle at that term systemic racism. And I, I kind of look and go, Wait, wait, are, are you saying, when you say systemic racism, are you saying that people are fundamentally corrupt and that when people get together and they form an institution, they bring that corruption into the institution systemically so that that corruption is part and parcel of the institution? I kind of go, well, yeah, that's what we call the world. When humans get together and do stuff, they bring that corruption systemically, okay? This shouldn't be too hard for us to grasp. So is there systemic racism? Is there systemic corruption? I go, yeah, you know what the problem is? Humans trying to work together. So, you know, my solution, and this is me opining, keep the system small. Because the bigger the system gets, the more corrupt it gets, the more power it gets, you know, uh, so rather than trying to, you know, clean up the system, my suggestion is always be creating new systems, new clean systems, you know, maybe always in reformation. All right. Uh, people identifying themselves by their sexual preference, you, you, Again, I hope you would have sympathy for these, for these people loved by God, okay? Uh, people brought up uh, Bible study, online aliases, you know, these anonymous aliases or digital selves, where people are actually creating a separate identity for themselves online, okay? Again, I don't do this to judge, just to say, hey, we're desperate for a name. We're desperate to have an identity that's given to ourselves, that's kind of outside of ourselves. And God says, no, no, your identity is found in me. Uh, people will find their identity in their family as well. 
you know, that's who they are. You take away their family and you take away their identity. Number three, the third commandment, the gift of Sabbath rest. Now, in the Torah, the Law and the Prophets, uh, your Sabbath rest was found on Saturday, the seventh day of the week. Six days you work, six days you labor, six days you provide for yourself. The seventh day, you take your hands off the wheel and you say, God is my provider. God is the one who gives me good things. New Testament, who is our Sabbath rest? And the answer is, Sunday school answer, Jesus. Jesus says, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden. I will give you rest. I will give you Sabbath. Take my yoke upon you, me and take my yoke upon you and learn from me for I'm gentle and humble of heart and you will find rest, Sabbath for your souls. I keep quote, trying to quote Romans 4 or 5 and I keep not getting it right. Uh, but to the person who does not work, that is to the person who Sabbaths, but instead believes in God who justifies the ungodly. You know, if we stop trying to earn our salvation, work for it, if we Sabbath, we take our hands off the wheels of salvation and say, open them up to God and say, give, we will receive God's righteousness. This is, I think, pretty explicit in Hebrews where it says, you know, God has given us a Sabbath. He's given us a true rest, and it's found in Jesus Christ. Uh, one person brought up the, the world's catechism is workaholism, no rest. There's no rest for the weary. Uh, you just work, 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 because work, uh, no rest. If you, if you look at what the world offers, you know, what does it offer? Where, where's the rest that it gives to you? You know, remember your recliner. You know, come to me and I will give you a recliner. I, come to me and I will give you a vacation. Come to me and I will give you Netflix. Uh, you know, we look for rest in retirement. We look for rest in leisure activities. We look for rest in escapism and avoidance. You know, we just want to escape the world. Uh, we can do that at the bottom of a bottle. Uh, we can do that in a fantasy novel. And again, what's the point? I'm not saying again that any of these things are bad in themselves. The question is, are they in the context of God's rest and who we are in Christ Jesus? Fourth commandment, honor your father and mother. The commandment that protects authority uh, authority is a difficult issue, uh, you know, because we can extend this to the government and to the state. And I start to get really leery at that point because of when humans get together, what they touch is corrupt. Yeah. So I, I have an issue with, you know, as far as authority of the state, though, God certainly says, you know, all authority is from me. So uh, where this gets seen in the world's catechism, you know, I, the way people talk about politicians to me is so shocking. It's like these people are your savior. You know, if you just vote for this person, then, then things will be good. And I go, I, I've seen, you know, both parties be in control of the government. And I'm going, okay, where are these people going to do what they said they were going to do? Because they seem to do the same thing, yet call it different. Okay, I'm a pining. Uh, the biggest way, though, I see this with authority uh, is abdication of responsibility, abdication of authority. I'm sure you can talk about other ways that, you know, authority is disrespected, uh, you know, sometimes rightfully so because authority gets corrupted. Uh, but the biggest problem I see is the abdication of authority. And the number one place I see the abdication of authority is with parents. I, I don't think I've emphasized this, but you know, at each of the six chief parts, the, it says, as the head of the house shall teach it in a simple way to his family, as the head of the house shall teach it. And this authority has been abdicated where parents go, oh, I'm not equipped, I can't do this. I haven't been to seminary. And Luther goes, yeah, I gave you the catechism. What more do you need? Uh, 
uh, you don't need seminary. I gave you the catechism. Teach the catechism to your kids. The catechism is amazingly profound and amazingly brilliant if you simply meditate on it and discuss it. I mean, what more do you need? And you got the Bible, you got the word of God. Uh, what more do you need? Uh, but the abdication of responsibility, the abdication of authority of parents, where we're constantly looking for experts and, and parents feel so ill-equipped to do the most basic of things. Uh, and I think we see the results of that. Uh, we see it with, with catechism and confirmation uh, instruction has been a complete and utter disaster uh, with the vast majority of children now I believe to the third and fourth generation, uh, have abandoned the church. Uh, it's scary. Uh, we see this with schooling as well, where, you know, what do we teach children when we group them together in by the same age? Okay, I don't know if you remember this, but, you know, growing up, uh, I would sometimes actually be in groups of people with people of multiple age, where you know, a 16-year-old instructs a six-year-old or a 10-year-old helps an eight-year-old how to swing a bat. You know, what are you learning? You're learning authority. You're learning how to be an adult. But instead, what do we do? You know, for 10, 12 hours a, a day, we shove kids in places where we're told, be quiet and listen and do what you're told by that adult. When do you learn to be an adult? And again, this is learned, this authority is learned in the family or not. So, <laughs> oh boy, this always gets me in trouble. And all I can do is throw up my hands and go, this is what the catechism teaches. This is what the Bible teaches. W what am I supposed to do? My authority is worthless if people abdicate their authority. Uh, you see this, I think, also with the delay of adulthood. Uh, you know, s school, I, I think, used to end at, at, at around age 12 or 13, and then you'd go and get a trade, and you would learn a trade, which is about the right time for kids. And again, this is me opining. Uh, 12 or 13 is about the right age for kids to learn a trade from a tradesman, you know, somebody who, who knows, the, knows the trade, right? Uh, but instead, we've delayed, we've delayed adulthood until 18 and then 21, and then now you gotta go to college, and now you gotta go to postgraduate work, uh, you know, now you gotta get a doctorate, uh, you know, and people aren't even getting married until age 30 or 40. What's with this delay of adulthood? And again, I would say this is an abdication of personal authority, that, that, I, that I have no authority over my own self. Oh boy, okay, I'm in deep water now. All right, fifth commandment, uh, the gift of life. And again, we have to value life all the way from uh, conception all the way to natural death. Uh, this valuing of life especially uh, means care for the vulnerable. Uh, we'll talk about this more. Uh, this is kind of the, the first gift, you know, of myself. You know, I have my own life. It's the most valuable gift that I myself have, you can say, uh, life and then because it rhymes wife or spouse. Uh, these are the, the gifts that I God has given to me personally. And so caring for life all the way through, it, it doesn't mean being anti, you know, anti, what is it? Uh, Anti-abortion, anti-euthanasia. But you see that in the culture of death that we have. Uh, it, it's, it's a little bit shocking. You know, I have a hard time believing this about people, but but apparently it's true that there are people who simply don't value human life, where if humans die, it's kind of like, oh, well, we have too many people on the earth and we actually need to lower the population. And so we, we don't value life. We'll get into this a little bit with marriage and family in the next one. Uh, but, but the idea that human life does not have value, that we're something like a plague or a pestilence on the earth. Uh, and there are people who actually believe this. Like, wow. Uh, the declining fertility rates where we simply don't value having children. You know, we delay marriage. We delay having kids. 
uh, where we have an inverse family tree where, you know, it used to be, you know, uh, a couple parents would have, you know, 16, 20, 30 grandkids to now four grandparents have one grandchild in inverse family tree. Wow. Uh, then scaring ourselves to death. I don't know if you noticed this. I mean, you must have noticed this. We have this scaring ourselves to death thing where, you know, if I were listing, you know, here's my top priorities to bring life and prosperity and fulfillment to people's lives. And I had a list of a hundred things. None of that makes the news. You know, things like number one, marriage. Well, I guess we could just go through the commandments uh, and say, oh, here, here are the things that bring prosperity and life and fulfillment to people, you know, things like eating real food and having a contented marriage and being content with your life. Those don't make it. But uh, oh man, I don't know how to do this without getting political. Just watch the news and see if the stuff on the news, when they talk about people dying, see what the percentage chance of you dying from that thing is. You know, a lot of times it's like one in a million or one in a hundred thousand or one in 10,000 chance that you'll ever die from that thing. And yet we need to panic and we need to freak out. Meanwhile, the things that are actually killing us, like bad marriages, not eating real food, not going outside, you know, those are the things that are killing us. Yet we're freaked out by the things that are, you know, outside of our control but we don't take care of the things that are actually inside of our control that are actually killing us. Oh boy. Commandment number six, you shall not commit adultery. This is the protection of the gift of sexuality and the gift of marriage. I want to emphasize sexuality is a good gift from God. Sexual intercourse is a good gift from God. It's not the original sin. Sexual intercourse isn't bad. God wants us to celebrate this gift. And anybody who knows, knows that the best sex is found in the, in the context of a lifelong commitment between a man and a woman. That's where the best sex takes place. And so note what God puts together. He, he puts together a man and a woman, one flesh. And from that love, they enjoy sexual intercourse they enjoy conception, they enjoy birth, they enjoy children, they enjoy family, they enjoy grandchildren. That's the good life, right? Uh, with the way God designed it, he puts all these things together as a whole. And what do we do in the world's catechism is rip all these things apart. So uh, the, the Catholics have this down really well. They're, to me, their logic is impressive. Uh, when, when you talk about their opposition to the pill, for example, because the pill separates what God has put together. Uh, it, it separates sexual intercourse from conception. And of course, <clears throat> we go, no, 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 I, I don't want that. I want to control when conception happens. I don't want God to be in control. Uh, so we separate sexual intercourse from conception. We separate sexual intercourse from marriage. We separate, uh, we, we even separate conception from birth. And we, we separate birth from marriage and family. Uh, no fault divorce uh, eliminates the lifetime commitment. Uh, free sex outside of marriage destroys the gift of sexuality by taking it outside of the gift. I, I, I'm still baffled, you know, it, this took me a long time to realize, you know, because some of you know people who are, they're living together and people call it, they're living in sin. They're living together, but they're not married. So uh, here's what finally dawned on me is when people are living together, they're married. You know, looks like a duck, walks like a duck, quacks like a duck, probably a duck. But you have all these ducks walking around going, I am not a duck. You have all these people who are married and they're saying, we're not married. So they break up and they say, oh, this wasn't a divorce. It was divorce. 
you were married, you just aren't saying so. And so my philosophy, and I don't get to practice this very much, so feedback would be nice, is just treat them like you're married. They're married. Oh, your wife, your husband. You know, I, I don't know if I'd be too pushy about it, but, you know, just kind of say, hey, you're married. Act like they're married. Treat them like they're married. You know, don't be a jerk about it, uh, but just reinforce the fact they are married. They are one flesh. If they break up, they're getting a divorce. Uh, the other the other part about this uh, that I think is so sad with the feminist movement, which in some ways has been wonderful for women, but, but note how de-womanizing these things are. The pill prevents a woman from getting pregnant. In other words, it prevents a woman from being a woman. Abortion prevents her from giving birth. In other words, from being a woman. Sex outside of marriage prevents a woman from being a wife. In other words, from being a woman, from being exactly what she was designed by God to be and to do, and it's all taken away from her. And what does she end up looking like? A woman who doesn't conceive, a woman who doesn't give birth, a woman who doesn't get married. What is she? And it's like, looks like a man, an awful lot like a man. It's like, we don't need any more men. We've got plenty of men. We need women to be women because what are men apart from women? And the answer is they're animals. Men need women to civilize them because men, yeah, they, they have sex like animals, as many women as they can possibly get. It, it's just really, really sad. And so when women fail to be women to hold a man accountable and say, oh, you want sex? You know, where's the ring? Where's the commitment to me and to our children? Men desperately need that. It's really good for men. Uh, this, uh, the, whole, the whole business of uh, the separation of sex from marriage has been horrible for men, just absolutely destructive. Uh, men need one woman really badly. All right, uh, the seventh commandment, you shall not steal. This is the gift of income and possessions, and this would be private property. So if you don't like private property, uh, you know, how can you have theft if it's not private property? How can you steal from me if it's not mine? Uh, these are good gifts from God. And so think of the ways that we steal people's income you know, their, their right to earn a living and their possessions. And I'm going to try not to be political here. It gets really convoluted very fast with politics. So I'm just going to stick to, you know, personal matters. Laziness is a way of stealing from our bosses. You know, when we don't do the work that we're assigned to do and paid to do. Uh, entitlement, you know, having a sense of entitlement, like I'm owed this. Not, oh, hey, you know, we've exchanged services you know, thank you. You've served me. I've served you. Uh, but the the thought that, you know, I'm actually owed something from you. I'm actually owed your stuff. I, I the loss of vocation and serving. Uh, and this, this, I, I only heard this recently that like the word vocation, we're not supposed to use that anymore. Uh, I don't know. Some kind of political correctness thing. I, I haven't heard much about it. I heard only offhandedly. But the doctrine of vocation is so awesome, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Uh, but the greatest form of charity, the most common charity we have is mutually serving one another. Not the charity of a handout, but the charity of personal, uh, personal transactions. I'm not saying that right. Uh, but when we are mutually serving one another, that's the greatest form of charity is I serve you, you serve me, husband and wife, parent and child, worker and employer. We serve each other. That's what we're doing. And so when we go to the store and we buy something, you know, it would be like the grocer says to us, wait a second, you're taking all this food? What have you done to ser serve your fellow human?" in order to deserve this food. And you take out money and you say, ah, I earned this by serving my fellow human. Good stuff. 
The Eighth Commandment, uh, you shall not something about your neighbor. <laughs> bear false testimony. That's it. Uh, you shall not bear false testimony against your neighbor. Uh, this is the gift of reputation. Now, while that sounds very much like a courtroom scene, uh, we need to be careful about how we define gossip. In general, I think we tend to define gossip as saying things that are not true. To which I say, do not destroy people and their reputation. I don't care if it's true. I don't care if it's factual. Don't destroy people's reputation. Don't destroy their personal name. In, in the second commandment, the name of God is the name God bestows on us. But my personal name means an awful lot to me. Anytime you destroy my personal name, my reputation, you are destroying me and a good gift that God gave to me. Uh, so gossip is anything that's said about another person that harms their reputation. Okay, be very careful about that. Uh, the cancel culture does this, uh, simply just destroys people. And by the way, there's a cancel culture on both the right and left politically. And I noticed that both sides are blind to their own cancel culture and they justify it, self-justify it. Uh, so just be aware of that. It's like, oh, if you say the wrong thing, you're out. Uh, then another way uh, is seeking fame apart from God you know, seeking fame for ourselves rather than for the sake of Christ. Uh, another way this is done, uh, and this is related to gossip, is when we destroy a person's name by making fun of their name. Uh, you know, I used to do this with a particular actress, uh, and and I would call, call, make a pun and say degenerate. And then I realized, whoa, this is a human being whom God loves and cares about. I'm not going to keep calling her by my punny name however funny I think I am, how dare I say and make say something bad about a person, uh, regardless of how degenerate they are, how dare I say that publicly or even in my own thoughts, right? All right, last comment. And, and here I was going to put this uh, circle of wellness. You know, I don't know if you can see that, but I have this circle of wellness and you can, you can Google it. Uh, just Google circle of wellness. It's really cool is this helpful thing that talks about how do we have well-being and we order our lives so that, you know, our emotional health, our work health, our intellectual health, environmental health, financial health, social health, you know, relational health, our physical health, our spiritual self, that they're all in balance and we have all those things in balance. Life is so beautiful and so good. And I go, that's true. But think about what if you made a circle, a wellness circle based on the Ten Commandments. And you started putting, you know, our spiritual well-being, that's commandment three, you know, uh, our relationship to authority, life, sexual sexuality and marriage, our income and property, our reputation, our contentment and gratitude, which I haven't talked about yet. Uh, what if we made that our circle of wellness? And at the very center was God and the name that he placed upon us, and maybe you want to put the third commandment too, our spiritual well-being, God's word and sacraments, they're the ones that put everything else into order and bring us well-being. If God is at the very center of all of that. All right, 10th commandment, which I failed to mention, the ninth and 10th. I'm not going to give a defense on how these are separate things, uh, but you know, the either the ninth commandment in Exodus 20 is you shall not covet your neighbor's uh, property. And the ninth commandment in the Deuteronomy 5 is you shall not covet your neighbor's wife. And, and the which of those is the central gift for a man? Uh, you know, is it his property that God has given to him to pass on to his heirs? Or is it his wife, which is his one flesh union? Uh, anyway, it's fascinating to look at the two different views. And then it's kind of like, or all the other stuff as well. Uh, you know, don't envy his inheritance or his one flesh union uh, or anything else. Tenth commandment. Uh, this is the gift of contentment and gratitude. And again, uh, notice what what the world's catechism does. You know, entitlement that I'm entitled to something makes you so unhappy. So ungrateful. 
uh, dissatisfaction with life and what God has given you, fleeing and avoiding suffering, not wanting what, what God has given you, wanting what God has not given to you. Uh, all this is totally destructive of happiness. But learning to be content and say, God's given me this. God's given not God given me that. Okay. Uh, it's more complex than that and why discussion is needed. You know, it's like, is it okay to go after that? Is it okay to try to avoid suffering? Sometimes yes, sometimes no. Don't don't have a, a clear answer to that. All right. God's peace be with you. Join me in prayer. Heavenly Father, we ask that we would celebrate the gifts that God has given to us, uh, which we can truly only enjoy through Jesus's death and resurrection. Uh, otherwise, we go to the world's catechism rather than Jesus's catechism. Thank you for your gifts, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. And now the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, guard your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. Amen.